So I want to say, well, since you mentioned that, we do have a brand new website. It's racemattersfriends.com um, that Karen Centenator did for us. It's very nice. Um, there is a link for volunteers. There is a link to make donations. We're trying to keep it up to date. And I think uh, I'm going to be on board for writing some blogs. Just writing stuff about what's happening. So I probably will write about um, tonight's meeting a little bit and looking forward and all that other kind of stuff. So our general mode of operating in these meetings is it's a discussion. It's meant for us to share information and ask questions. It's not like competitive or anything like that. Um, we're very candid and we, we tend to be fairly inquisitive. Jeff's used to us being kind of pesky and insistent, so he's not going to be um, offended or anything because we're like a tiny bit or something like that. And Mikey knows that we're that way. It's all in love, man. There's no, there's no bad vibe going. Um, and so, I, what I thought it would be a nice to have you, um, uh, Chief Jones, talk about what you've um, been doing. But as a preface to that, I want to say because I am a PhD student and I, I try to bring my, what I learn to my activism work and my research work is that I have been studying um, since about 2016 the dialogue that we've been having around community policing. So what did, what did Chief Burton say? What did the city manager say? What, was, what did that discourse look like? And so it was very defensive. Right, it's very defensive, and also in terms of talking about disparities in data, there was a, a lot of resistance. And so I've noticed just in the time that you become the interim chief that that it's not a defensive um, stance, and it's very nice to not be put on, on the defensive right way. And I, and I think a lot of people notice that. So I really want to compliment you for Thanks. shifting that dialogue. Um, I was, Lynn was talking about the VSR meeting and she said that it was videotaped and there was minutes and I was like, what? What happened? Let's do something now. <laughs> That's totally awesome. Like when, oh my God, I've never had, oh and it's on the website. Holy crap, what happened? So that's really exciting. I mean, we just haven't had that kind of transparency when it comes to having conversations. So I really want to commend you, I think, one huge way to build trust is being open. And the reason we tape our meetings is a lot of people can't get here at this time, and we don't want people to think we're doing something secretive or whatever. Um, it, it's just a conversation, but a lot of times the conversations we have are not the conversations that we want to have in public. So by videotaping and showing, we can say, oh, the world didn't fall apart because they were having this conversation and everything was cool. So, um, I just wanted to start uh, start with that, um, and also I, I want to also say that we can handle uh, difficult news, complex news. Um, I don't know. I'll get back to you. Help me. Stuff like that, <coughs> right? Stuff that we I just, already say. Yeah. <laughs> don't get smart now, okay? <laughs> yeah. That's not going to change. Okay, don't, do, <laughs> don't get smart. Don't get smart. Yeah. So, um, yeah, kind of, sorry, I know you, I know that you cannot talk about um, HR issues, and I'm, I'm not saying this to let you off the hook, <laughs> but I am saying that it concerns me um, that this guy, you know what I'm talking about, Mr. Dave Tate, and still has a job. We, we went and had a meeting with uh, Wen Choi, and Alexander Cartwright, because they fired their MVPD officer who was dressing in blackface. And our challenge actually to them was, okay, that's great that you fired this guy, but we actually want you to be the anchor of equity in the community and engage the community in a larger conversation as to why that kind of behavior is inappropriate. And it might seem silly, but even for um, Lieutenant Tate, Sometimes we make the assumption that everyone knows that's bad, right? Because people start saying, "Well, he has an he has an individual right, you know, freedom of speech." And my caveat to that is, when you are a public servant, the the threshold is higher and the expectation is higher. So that's really where I came from with him. 
So I'm just telling you that so you know where we're at. And I don't know what you're going to say, and I'm not asking you to uh, comment on that case. But I say that by way of saying that's, that's our expectation um, as, a, as a group. So the day that the police start saying, hey, by the way, this is why this is wrong, and we're going to have a larger conversation, and you beat him, you to do it. <laughs> okay, take it away. So where would you like me to start? Where would you like me to Okay. So, as everybody here knows, I chose to take over at a time where we had had years of uh, just lack of communication, and I know I've said that over and over in the media, in the media, but communication really was the issue, not just internally, but externally. Uh, people did not, internally, did not feel that they could trust the administration. They did not feel as though they would be treated with due process, or uh, as the term we like to throw around a lot, procedural justice. Uh, procedural justice for the Columbia Police Department, in my opinion, meant that we were to provide procedural justice outside of the department, but it was not something that we were willing to address internally. So when I came into this with that lens, I saw that I needed to improve communication, improve processes, improve policies, improve training, uh, and all of that is still a work in progress. But we had to start with communication because without communication, none of those other areas can be addressed. And um, we have worked, and I say we because even the cops have worked very hard to work on communication internally. So when we email back and forth. You wanted to know some of the things that I had done and some of it's been publicized, but first thing I did was I got rid of gold buttons. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be divisive inside of an organization, you're going to be divisive outside of an organization. So gold buttons went away from the time I went up to the podium to accept this new position on. There were no more gold buttons. I don't know why. Can you explain gold buttons? I'm I, ignorant. So <laughs> yeah, our command staff uniforms and Tom, I don't think they were there when you were there at all until he came, right? Bird initiated it. Right. But we had these gold buttons that were about this big around mm -hmm. um, that went up the front. And everywhere that there was a button, there was a gold button. Mm -hmm. So it was really so that internally people knew the difference between command staff and a line level officer or supervisor. The problem I have with that is if you don't know that I lead the organization, mm -hmm without gold buttons, then I'm not leading the organization. <laughs> so we got rid of gold buttons. Um, the other thing that I did is we had several units outside, you know, our internal affairs unit has uh, personnel records. Nobody should have access to that outside of our personnel folks. Our narcotics unit houses intelligence records. Nobody, including me, should have access to those documents outside of the intelligence folks. Everything else, or the armory, um, nobody should have access to all of our guns and ammunition outside of the people who are qualified to deal with those things. Outside of that, um, several people had the locks changed on their offices because they were important. Mm -hmm. And to get things as simple as a notebook or a pen, when we ran out in our little supply shelf we had to call a supervisor if it was after hours and have them come in and unlock a door. It was dysfunctional, so I had all <laughs> the locks changed. Um, so through this process, some people are really happy with those changes. Some people are really not happy with those changes because in their mind I was taking away some of that authority that they had, some of that power that they have, but I've also talked about this at length. If we're not willing to share some of that internally, 
we're not going to share that externally. So it's very literal for me in a lot of ways, all of these steps that I take, and even though they seem really small steps, that translates into what we do out in the community. If you've paid attention, there's a lot of social media chatter where officers are going to people's houses. They're helping with people with uh, developmental disabilities. They're doing all of these things very publicly that they really would not have done before because they didn't see it as their position. Mm -hmm. We empower them to go out and do the right things for the right reasons and they go do it. And so what I've tried to do is take the, the command structure and the power and authority that's at a command structure and push that down. So officers have the ability as line level officers to make decisions that positively impact other people in our community. So that's there are several changes I've made, but if there's anything specifically you want to talk about, this is a discussion and not being lecturing. So what does that look like? When you say um, do the right thing, what does that mean? Give me, give me a scope of what that looks like to you. I mean, I think you're very thoughtful about, mm -hmm. well, you're, you've are you been doing this for a long time, Tom, too. Like, you, show, you, you do what you call the right thing for the right reasons for reasons that I don't know. So just kind of tell me what that looks like and how do you build that expectation in the officers so they know what you mean when you say they do the right thing for the right reasons. So I'm gonna give you an example. I think everybody here knows a few years ago I bought a young lady a car battery, tried to jumpstart her car, didn't work, <coughs> took her to Walmart, bought a car battery, tried to install it in the car, that didn't work, I'm not a mechanic. <laughs> I drove her to work in my police car, went in and talked to her boss. Got a lot of media attention, a lot of positive attention to the police department. What Tom knows and what a lot of people don't recognize is I violated four different policies by doing that. <laughs> right? I can't jump start a car because we have a lot of electronics in our car and there's a risk that we'll fry our radios, our sirens, our lighting systems. We're not allowed to jump start cars. We have jump boxes for that, but I violated a policy. Right? Then I gave her a ride to Walmart, bought policy violation number two. I bought her a car battery with my own money, money, policy violation number three, and then I took her to work. Oh, I'm sorry, I installed the car battery, violation number four, then I took her to work, violation number five. So I actually violated five policies. So I went into work, and my boss said, great job, thanks for doing that, you made us all look great. I said, well, I violated, I think I said four policies. I lied to him. I violated five policies in doing that. So you can give me a letter of commendation and my write-up for the five policies I violated at the same time. See how ridiculous that is? When we have policies that officers try to do the right things for the right reasons, but they violate our policy, they're concerned about doing those right things and getting in trouble for it. So it's my job to address the policy changes that need to be had so that we can do those things when we need to or want to so that we can affect positive change. But without doing that and addressing those policies, you have people who are worried because it's their livelihood and they'll get in trouble for it. Mm -hmm. So I know you, the department's addressing policies, so what is the shorthand of right things that you can do that are not going to be problematic? So you broke those five things that you said are four things. Right. So institutionally, are you encouraging people to your officers to do that kind of thing? Or or so like what policy did you change that gave like line officers um, more of a cushion to treat people like they're human beings? That's what I'm interested in. I'll tell you the first thing, and some people in this room might disagree, and Tom even might disagree, but I changed our pursuit policy. And what is that? So, I'll give you an example. Again, you call me, someone has just broken into your house, pointed a gun at you, and they've left. They're no longer pointing a gun at you, they're not a threat to you anymore, but they left. You give us a car description, we find it five miles away, and it takes off from us. It drives 22 miles an hour over the speed limit, and we follow it. 
you as a citizen who just got robbed expect us to chase the person who just victimized you in your home. Our policy prevents us from going 22 miles an hour over the speed limit. Mm -hmm. The right thing to do is to serve the person who needs our help. And if I prevent officers from taking the appropriate action by policies that are so restrictive that they can't do their jobs, they can't serve you in that way. So that's, the, that's one of the policies that changed. So that you can chase people? <coughs> yes. But it's still very restrictive. Yeah. But so, it's, so say, say more than more <coughs> about that chasing so people don't go, oh, Chief Jones says that they can chase people now. So. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I'm just saying, I, I have issues with like, like chasing. I like just the language. You know, like I'm a wimp. I, I got to tell you. So like, what, what does that mean? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. I wouldn't pursue somebody, but I, I'm, not a, I'm not a cop. So tell me what that means to like safely pursue somebody, right? Because we've seen a lot of chase pursuits that are really like damaging. Like I did see one recently where they were really smart. And what I appreciated about the chase is when they stopped, uh, one of the, some of the guys were getting a little amped up and whoever was in charge of the scene said, whoa, chill, pull it together, right? We're, and, this, and it was a kid involved, a kid got away with the car. I don't know if that you posted that the kid got in the car. But so they kept the situation under control. They did follow and chase the car. It made sense. And I just let this kid drive the car. But they were out somewhere. What does that look like responsibly in Columbia? So they need to weigh out what the seriousness of the offense is, mm -hmm. is against the immediate need for apprehension. They look at speeds, um, whether they're in a residential area or on the interstate. Um, weather conditions, pedestrian traffic. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we are training the supervisors and telling them is if the officer sounds amped up on the radio, like they're not in control, to call the pursuit. Because as Tom will tell you, as Mike will tell you, you can hear the officers who have never been or rarely been in a pursuit get on the radio. And they are so amped up sometimes that we know that they cannot concentrate on all of the things that they need to concentrate on while they're driving a car in that manner. So, and, and that's, I can't think of all of them off the top of my head, but there are all of these things that are constantly being weighed against what we're chasing the person for. Now, if it's four o'clock in the morning, there's no traffic out, and we think someone is driving drunk and they're there's no other cars on the road. That's that's different than in the middle of the day, lunch hour, same drunk person driving down Providence with other traffic and foot traffic. So the officers need to weigh that out. And there's, when I say it's restrictive, there are, and our policies are posted, but you should look at it because it's, there really are all of these things that they're constantly weighing against the seriousness of the offense uh, to decide whether they continue to pursue. Right. So to pursue someone based on the seriousness of the offense, mm -hmm. is, that's great. I like that. That's, that's part, part of it. Part of it. Is there another part do you think that is important to understanding that? Well, if someone runs and they've committed a crime, then there's an element there that we may chase them or may not, depending on all of this other stuff. So it may be a misdemeanor. Okay. But another example, we know of people who shoot other people and they have a revoked driver's license. We have a lot of good information, but people are afraid of these people who are shooting, so we don't have any witness te testimony, things like that. But we, we generally know who's shooting at other people. That person's driving, their license is revoked, and they run from the police. That's gonna be a minor offense, but that added knowledge that the officer has that this person has been shooting at people in the past is gonna cause them to weigh that a little heavier than someone who just got scared because they have a suspended license and runs from us. There's a lot to take in and a lot to weigh against the need to pursue. So it sounds like one of the messages is that you're trusting officers to use good judgment in weighing these factors as opposed to having sets of restrictions that say 
you can't do this no matter if it would make sense or not. You have to. And part of community policing is giving people at those levels enough authority and power to make those decisions. And if they don't feel empowered to do that, then they they can't think outside of the box. They can't come up with solutions for some of these things that we deal with every day. As part of the VSR meeting that we had last night is empowering officers to go have these conversations that everybody else has seemed to be afraid to have, right? So if, were you in the meeting where I told them you're not gonna get in trouble for having candid conversations? So I'll keep my word. If they go in there and they have a conversation and they sound like the worst, most awful person because they're telling me the truth about how they feel, they're not gonna get fired for that. I need them to have those conversations so if it's an issue that we need to address, we can address it. But without doing that, we're not going to get where we need to go. So that's great. That's the internal stuff. <coughs> that reminds me, in education, they talk about that if you just say no, no, no all the time, you end up really, you know, uh, making people contract and pull back and lose confidence in their ability. And so it's really important for students that we want to give them uh, options, right? And uh, it's interesting that it works, that actually works in all professions. <laughs> With all people, if you give people um, options um, where they can um, be creative and take the lead, that uh, they tend to do really good things. Peggy, you had uh, Yeah, I, I, I was responding to when you talked about people being amped up and being able to judge their kind of psychological state. And we, it reminded me of that infamous video that was on the sheriff's website at one point, probably had taken down, where there are a whole lot of amped up people chasing people, jumping out of their cars, grabbing them, and that you're the person whose name I will not mention who preceded you also talked about police officers liking to do that kind of stuff, liking to chase people, down and drive fast and that kind of stuff. So how are you, I, I liked that awareness that there is a psychological state somebody could get into where they are a danger either to themselves or to somebody else. Um, how would you build that into um, training, screening people, uh, how, how will you be able to counsel people uh, about that state of, state of mind and body that they could get into where they could do not the right thing? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say two things, and one of them you might not like, but it's, okay. it's, it's my view, so I'm going to tell you. One of the things that we talk about is officers being excited to chase people, um, having them that rush from catching someone after a foot chase and that's a very real thing and people do enjoy that but taken out of context that sounds like we're these kind of neanderthals <laughs> that like to go out and fight and do these things but really if you look at it in context we come to work every day wanting to help people and if you have that person who has just victimized somebody else raped them robbed them stolen something from them damaged their property and we get into a chase with that person, and I liken it, and maybe it's not the best thing, but I liken it to going fishing. And we're out there and we're trying to catch the big fish, the people who are out there victimizing other people. And if those people run, and I'm the person who chases them, as scary as that is while I'm doing it, as scary as it is while I'm fighting them, as scary as it is while I'm trying to take them into custody, at the end of that, I will be excited because I caught them. No matter how big the fight is with that big fish, at the end, I have, and maybe not the best word to use, but I've gotten the prize. I've gotten the person who has victimized somebody else. That's very important to us. So the former chief was, of some of the things I disagree with, I don't completely disagree with that statement. I don't think it was the smartest statement. I don't think it had the best context. But we do like to chase people. But just, We're to, not, but just to be fair, because we talked about this already, I, I, all the things that he said in context are right. inappropriate. So I think we need to be really clear about what you're talking about in terms of chase 
and what he was talking about in terms of change no, I... were totally different things. We need to be really clear about, because he says some things like, well, cops don't want to be cops unless they can chase people and stuff like that. That's some nonsense, right? I understand, because, and, and I think and we've had these conversations. I think, this a, I think this is a man thing. Want to chase people and get into... Oh, it's not just no, a man thing. Oh, yeah. no, no, I, I, I told you I'm scared. Like, I'm not doing any of that. But I'm just saying that what he said, because I have a transcript of it, and what you're saying are not the same thing. I, I just didn't want there to be some misunderstanding that I don't I don't appreciate that I have people that not only have to go out and offer services from the food bank or try to find someone health care or find counseling or family counseling or whatever that is financial counseling whatever it is that we try to offer help or to solve a solution I want officers to be able to do that they also might have to go give a parking ticket they might talk to someone about blowing leaves into the neighbor's yard. <laughs> and then the very next call may be a shooting. And I need people who are excited about all of those things. And if that means chasing somebody in one second and writing a parking ticket the next, I need people who are that flexible. So I didn't want to mislead you and say, no, it's not fun for them to chase people. It is. They, they get some satisfaction out of being able to chase people and arrest them. You're right, the context was off because there was no discussion of balance. Cops like to help people. A lot of those people that we see stories about who bought someone McDonald's comes to mind or helped the homeless guy, the homeless veteran get a hotel room, those are some of my most proactive police officers who go out and chase people. But we don't tell that part. It's either one or the other. I can't have a police officer that's one or the other. That is no, not community and I, police. And I, and I don't dis I don't disagree with you. I'm just saying that in the context of that conversation that he was having, it was not a community policing or a people centered conversation. And the conversation you're having is remarkably different. And I and I understand not wanting to throw Chief Burton under the bus. You don't have to throw him under the bus. Here he goes, under the bus. So uh, it's a totally different situation. And I think that's that was one of our issues is that there it was sort of this us versus them kind of context and, and that's not that's not what we wanted, but that's that's what's written and that's what was said. So I, I really appreciate your um, putting more context and putting more meat on the bones on that. Yeah. I was also responding to you you were drawing a line and saying somebody could go too far. Somebody could be too amped up. Sure. And that was you know, I was interested in how are you going to um, help people decide when they get to that point. So I had a conversation with a young officer about an hour before I came here. The conversation is she got into a pursuit. And she was really excited because it was a domestic assault suspect who had a gun. He's a convicted felon, had a gun, not supposed to have a gun, ran from the police. And she said, my my radio traffic was horrible. My driving was good, but my radio traffic was horrible. She'd been in another, actually she may have been my first person to get in pursuit after I changed the policy. And I had several people comment to me that her radio traffic was excellent in the first pursuit. So I talked to her and I said, well, what happened? And she said, it, it happened so fast and I just immediately got amped up. And I said, okay, next time that happens, I want you to speak out loud and you're gonna feel silly doing it, but I want you to say to yourself, talk slow, walk slow. And I think we've talked about this walk, before. Can you do your walk for me? No. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a walk? <laughs> If you watch videos of me, it looks like I limp when there's really something serious going on. And this was something taught to me by someone else at the police department. But they told me when I get worked up to tell myself, walk slow, talk slow. And I told her the same thing. What that does is it gives me a second to put myself back into control. So if you look at videos of me showing up to serious incidents, you will see me walking slow and talking slow. If you hear me on the radio, I will be talking slow. I may be through the roof worked up because there's a cop getting in a fight and they're hurt and they're calling for help or something else major going on, but you won't hear that from me. 
And what, what I asked that young officer tonight is to tell herself that and see if it helped. So there's really some mentoring and coaching that has to go along with this, and it's going to be a learning process, and people are going to make mistakes, especially as we evolve into this model where they're making decisions on their own that they haven't had to make or haven't been expected to make before, and I'm okay with that. And what I've told them is, if you're doing things for the right reasons, you're doing things with a good heart, I can deal with some of the policy violations. That doesn't mean I'm going to come after you with a hammer. It just means that we're going to fix it. And whether that means through training or a policy change because they're doing the right thing and violating policy anyway, like getting a car battery, or through coaching. But there has to be that procedural justice inside that goes along with coaching goes along with that and fits nicely. So. So about two years ago, so I was met with Warren Sergeant Hester about a plan you were drafting to convert the whole department to security policing. Do you have like a larger plan that you're using to create something like that, something that really gets the whole team on board with that velocity? So if you remember parts of that plan, I am currently working on parts of that plan. Great. Not trying to update it, but trying to put some of that into action because I have a very short period of time to do this. I don't know if I'll be the next chief, but I know that I have this opportunity now, so I'm gonna change the things that I can. So if you remember, one of the things we talked about is staffing. And prior administration, prior city manager really was pushing getting more cops. And in all honesty, being up front, do I think we need more cops? Yes, eventually. But what I have to prove to everybody else, because no one really trusts that we use things efficiently or effectively before, is that I'm doing everything the best that I can with what I have. And if we want to do it better, that we have to consider having more resources. So what we talked about is having officers in different beats who didn't leave those beats. Um, that takes a lot of cops. Mm -hmm. So what that does is it makes those beats bigger. So we currently have eight beats. Um, I have asked the patrol commanders to come up with a staffing plan that puts officers in each beat and then has what we call float cars, people who aren't assigned a beat at all. But what that does is if you're an officer in the southwest part of town and a five officer call, a disturbance with weapons comes up in the northeast part of town, that officer in the southwest part of town doesn't have to leave because those float officers are going to go but the people in that part of town have their cop in that part of town. We're not there yet, we're working on it, but uh, I'm hoping to get that far in our plan that we talked about. For the people who don't know, I sat down with members of this group, I have met with other people in the community, Mike sat down with us and we wrote a draft plan, and this was well before it was talked about having a community information <laughs> plan. Yeah. It just didn't get shared with anybody. Um, <coughs> And I don't know the reasons for that, but I can speculate. Um, so what, what people will have to recognize, including me internally, is where, because we have to, we're going to have to try to move that around and see how effective that is, keeping those officers and those beats and having float cars. And then eventually, if we have more cops and people like that model and it's going well, then we shrink the size of those beats, have more of them with officers in each one. But that's going to take more cops. So when I talk about needing more cops, that's what it would be for. But we need to see where we're at now and see how it works. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to ask for more until I've done everything I can with what I have. Right. Okay. If you were to get a windfall of additional officers, about what would you think would be adequate to I don't really know the answer to that. Um, I know the number 50 has put out there, if you think roughly five to six officers per position. So if you staff one, one position, you know, one, one beat for all the shifts, 365 days a year, it's gonna take, I think they say 5.67 officers. So because you have vacation time and time off in there and you have to have that many to do one position. So when I say 50 officers, people are like, oh my gosh, 50 officers, but it's really 10 positions in the city. 
if that makes sense. So I don't know that 50 is enough for what I want to do eventually. I think for what the citizens in this community want, I don't know that that's enough, but it would be a start. Um, but I want to see where we get with what we have first, because I think that's fair. Um, one of my concerns is, speaking of staffing, is that I'm thinking out loud for just a moment. So two thirds of the general fund budget is for, for public safety, and a big part, a big chunk of our issues are social services related. But we spend a fraction, a very small fraction of money on social services. Simultaneously, the city has been growing very rapidly and does not have in place any kind of metric or rubric to recoup the cost from development for the footprint that it causes to the city. So it's not just um, streets and fire, it's, there's also a footprint on services like police and fire and libraries and all that other <coughs> stuff. So I'm wondering, are you thinking in, in your mind, in the larger picture, about how to have that conversation, maybe you have, already have, with the interim city manager, et cetera, et cetera, because to me, it just, it, it doesn't seem right. It's kind of like people parking at the airport for free, but then we keep raising <laughs> the, the, the fees, for paratransit and we got shitty public transportation and like there's some there's some kind of and, and that's also attributable to to growth and not having these larger conversations about infrastructure. So to me, um, I don't blame you got I don't blame the police for not having enough officers. I blame our larger um, policymakers for not thinking more broadly and smarter and aggressively about hey, if we're going to do X, which we already know this is what happens, if we do X, it's going to cause Y. So I, I can't, to me, it's hard for me to support a, a tax <laughs> increase or anything like that for officers if we're neglecting um, our marginalized people in transportation and social services and all these other places because police department is like really wealthy in comparison to those other things. And that's not to negate the fact that we need officers. So I know that's kind of heavy, but I'm, 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 ho I'm I want, I want policing to understand that our conversation has been really focused on the institution that has the most power and the most money compared to all the other services where people complain, well, we don't want you police to be doing social services. Well, then the hell will fund it. You know what I'm saying? But it's not being funded. So that's the tug and pull that I, I see where I, I'm concerned about talking about staffing and we're not talking about all the other joints that go with it. So I think you will be, I have been, I won't say what you will do. I have been pleasantly surprised by some of the conversations that my boss has. Um, when talking about money and trying to find resources, he it's he doesn't tell me no. He tells me I'll try, and that goes a long way with me because when I say that, I I mean I'm going to try. So I'm encouraged that they will look for funding sources. But the second part of the things that I have ideas about, like social services, we've talked about this personally, you know, one on one. But I think it's really important that we have someone do case management because we do go out and deal with a lot of people who use social services and the police, like it or not, are a very effective way to get people in touch with those services because we work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and at three o'clock in the morning when someone's in crisis, the police show up. Whether it's a law enforcement matter or not, we're the ones that are going to get called because there's nobody else to call at 3 o'clock in the morning. So we show up. So what we've moved to is getting all of our police officers CIT trained. Everybody knows what that is, right? Crisis intervention team. Right. So that's just a, a jump off point. But 
what we've also looked into and we're continuing to look into it is seeing how we could fund a social worker embedded in the police department. Um, a lot of agencies go to a co-response model where they'll have a team of social workers that do case management. They go out with the police officers on these calls and start directing services and doing case management through the police department because it really is an effective place to do the handoff just because of the nature of our operation. So when I mention those types of things, I, I haven't been told no, which is encouraging to me. It's very encouraging. Um, I recognize that it's not going to happen overnight. I recognize that a lot of things have to fall into place, and by fall into place, I mean we have to force them into place. Mm -hmm. um, but I have had a lot of support as someone who has come in as an interim. You know, I've, I've had conversations with my friends and with Tom. You know, we talk about when you go in there, are you going to be able to change some things, or do they just want you to maintain? And I didn't get that message at all. It was, you go be the chief and do what you need to do. In my, in my dream world, I don't know about the rest of your dream world, but in, in my dream world, I would like to think that the medical school and health professions and all these other places on campus would want to lend their anchor to your work with the nursing school and writing grants and um, also doing some cross training with um, physicians and nursing so that we're not separate islands um, doing this work and that troubles me because that's a lot on one person and when I think of community policing I'm not thinking that okay you guys are all just going to do internal and external procedural justice I am thinking about wait a minute we have all this other human capital out here this is a land grant institution city right am I right so how is there how can we get the institution to invest its footprint um, with you or with City Hall. And I know that's a really dream big thing for me. Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Kelly. So hi. I work at Central Missouri Community Action now, but um, a long time ago I worked at True North. And remember when there was an advocate, that True North had an advocate that became the on-call person to go out with one TV calls. And she was on call like 24 seven. And I don't know exactly how that worked out, you know, but I thought, I was thinking about that something we were just talking, that maybe there could be some more partnerships where you do cross-training and then having people on call for mental health who could also be there as extra people when you have those types of situations. And um, I don't know if they still do that with the on-call advocate the way they had. Um, had that conversation this morning. So that has kind of fallen off, just that one particular thing that I have something else to say. Right. But um, we're looking at trying to get that started again. Um, one of the things that we're doing with social services is one of the providers in town that has some of the grant funding <coughs> that's passed through the health department is, is offering to give us iPads. So at 3 o'clock in the morning if we have someone who's in crisis and we want to get them hooked up with a counselor so that they can do some assessment, have some conversation, and maybe try to look at moving that case management or assignment along, we can do that through FaceTime or Skype. I don't remember which thing they use. But you but probably use either one. Do what? <laughs> you probably use either one. <laughs> <laughs> For anybody who knows me, I'm lucky to be able to use an iPhone. He's she, a learner. She knows that about me. Um, and see, these people can do this. <laughs> of course, there's, there's a process to get that approved and legal to look at it and they're legal and you know, have <coughs> so an MOU. Sometimes you don't have iPads already, but anyway. Well, I mean, we have iPads. We don't have iPads for that purpose. Oh, I so, see what you're saying. So the providers would be giving us those and on the other so end of that conversation, okay. at three o'clock in the morning on a Saturday if we have to, we'll be a counselor and we can say, okay, I want you to talk to this person and hand someone an iPad. Okay. So. That is a partnership that I'm pretty excited about if we can get all the logistics worked out because I think they're giving us 15 iPads. Mm -hmm. So that's 15 police officers that have access to someone 24 seven with the expertise to do counseling and assess whether they need you know, critical care or they need to go 
right now okay. to the university, but we are looking at different things like that. So um, part two of my dream day, um, my first real job that I had, I was in, I think I was in eighth grade. I got a job working at the police department, and I was a tutor. And I worked with students who, young kids who were having trouble in school. And I actually rode my bike to their house, and I helped them with their homework. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a really cool partnership to do with um, the police department. So they had someone, and they had these young kids and put them together. But you know, I work in the college fed, and I have all these students that need to do field service would be really cool mm -hmm. if there was a collaborative way that um, that they could do and, and they have to do field service every semester so this is not something they get paid for it's for their class but I don't know sort of dream big on wow how could we get their knowledge and experience in the department working with these young kids I'm thinking about how we interrupt that pipeline of students, right? How can we get them in to mentor and all that? So um, anyway, that's sort of my 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 dream big on. I'm still thinking about we have all this great capacity um, in the town. And it's it's really hard to get that collaboration going, and also like grants. Like I, it seems to me like. We should be able to get True North and nursing and like Stevens College. We should be able to like well, do this stuff, you know? It's actually not impossible. Collaborations are, are some of the best ways to get, get uh, competitive funding, but it takes time to develop those and work on that and figure out all the roles. And the, it, it's, it's well, I actually have two asks. Okay. And one of them kind of has something to do with what you just said. So I'm going to go ahead and ask. Okay. Look at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> are you going to tell me what it is? Yeah, if you're ready. Okay, tell me. Okay. So Am I going to be happy? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not here to make you happy. I'm yes, here you are. to tell you. No. <laughs> <laughs> do the right the thing. Do the right, okay, that makes me happy. That's good. That's and you've good. convinced me Thanks, I'm wrong before. Yeah. Oh, you're admitting? I, I've admitted <laughs> to you. Anyway. <sighs> wow. Um, just, to, just agree with whatever. And I, and I, I, I did this to myself. Um, so we are in the process of doing two things. Yeah. One is we are trying to start a youth program through our cadets. For people who do know me, I started the Columbia Police Department as a police cadet. I was into a lot of trouble as a kid. Um, we didn't have a lot of means, and my grandmother told me I was going to be a police cadet, which I joke about it, but it's kind of true. It was like the cheap version of military school in our mind, I think. <laughs> we could version. afford military school, but I could go to do the free program at the police department. Um, that was a life-altering experience for me. So I really think it's important that we reach out to youth through a cadet or explorer program. So they're in the process of rebuilding that. Um, we're looking at actually doing that with the fire department, so it's police and fire, which I don't like because they have really cool big trucks, but whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I am I wrong? <laughs> Tom's like, whatever. <laughs> so half a million dollars each. Yeah. So that program could really as part of that program, there are a lot of educational opportunities because in that you expose kids to a lot of different things. Um, so, and when those kids know that there's tutoring services, know that there's access to the Family Access Center for Excellence, and we start educating youth about what is there, they will educate their friends. Um, so my ask is, is that as members of our community, you help recruit and help build that program by making recommendations like that. So if there's something that these kids need to know about, that we can expose them to it. The other part is, is we need kids. And we need kids who are gonna be involved, who, um, 
have a potential to be leaders, even when other people marginalize them. I was one of those kids. Um, so that's my first ask, help with recruiting, help with, so it's kind of two in one, but help with some of those experiences so that they can be exposed to things that will help all of us. Um, the other thing is recruiting in general. And people have said some really ignorant things about recruiting and police work. Uh, recruiting is very difficult because we're always being recorded, um, we're always being second guessed. Um, it's a difficult job and for anybody who's done it for any length of time they will tell you that now more than ever it is a very difficult job and it's hard to recruit people but people have to see value in it and they have to feel supported and if we as a community are recruiting the people that we want to be the members of our police agency then we're going to have a police agency that reflects our community Without that, we're, we're in bad shape. Do you have a recruitment plan? We are working on a recruitment plan. Um, we have, what we have done historically and what we currently do is we piecemeal things. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna send cops to a minority college. We're gonna send cops to a job fair, we're going to put up billboards, we have, which, and some of this is good, but it's not a overarching cohesive plan. And we have been talking a lot about getting that more of a cohesive plan. I just like that you're smiling, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you think that means? Oh, Carol wants to focus the camera. I'm going to get a message just for people. Yeah. Oh. Oh, but uh, <laughs> since the attention is on me, one of the things I wanted to uh, mention was um, um, the, the, school, <clears throat> the school board, the school district created the X program, the Grow Your Own program for, mm -hmm. for recruiting minority teachers. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of investment that was put into that. These people then work tirelessly tirelessly to get scholarships from colleges uh, to recruit minority, to recruit teachers, uh, high school students who want to be teachers to get them uh, a full ride scholarship to Missou, Cornell College, Stevens, uh, Fayette, um, and the program is growing, right? Um, so that's the first thing that I thought out is that there, you know, it's, it can be done, just requires the right partnerships, the right collaborations. Um, peer, peer worked tirelessly for that, um, and I was part of that movement at the beginning of that. And so I know that it can happen, it's just a matter of um, getting a committee that is willing to, you've mentioned, uh, break some rules or, or jump through some groups that I think we just need money, right? Part of that is needing money that is going to fund those um, that program. I think there's a, if there's a leadership component to it, there might be students who might be so, interested in that. Sure. Um, and I want to clarify, I didn't tell people to break the rules. I said that sometimes <laughs> I fail and set the wrong rules. So sometimes we have to change those. But go ahead. So, um, <laughs> I used, to, I used to do recruitment for the medical school, but I've done different kinds of work in it. And so I want to, I think people think you can just um, do billboards and all that other kind of stuff. And you, and you might be able to get people to come, but I think what really matters is the climate and the culture that you have in your department so people stay. And that your, your cops, by their modeling and what they say at the department is what attracts people. So, um, you know, I, I, I traveled all over the country and I saw amazing students to recruit uh, students of color. And um, there were a lot of problems, but the big problem was is that once they got there, they were not welcomed, they weren't treated like they belonged there. And they were harassed and bullied and things like that, uh, which this is like, shouldn't be shocking, this is the data that shows most institutions what happens when you don't have 
Um, and I don't even want to say representation in diversity. I think whenever you have a small um, diversity, a, 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 a one particular kind of identity that's really outnumbered, um, you have problems. And so I'm glad that you're working on your internal and external procedural justice. And I think the more successful your department is in shifting or transforming the culture internally, it makes it an attractive um, place to work. Um, you know, even with Columbia Public Schools, they have recruited some uh, minority teachers. Uh, it's really hard for them to keep them. MU has attracted some of the, the best quality uh, people of color who teach there, but they d don't like the way they're treated and they're out of there. So um, I think I think when we think about recruitment, um, you know, go, we don't go a step further, which is how we're going to keep people. We can get them here, but the question is, what do we do to keep them? And it's, it's more than money. It's being able to go to work every day and really feel like um, I'm going to be treated, um, especially if I'm a woman, I'm not going to be treated well. And that's great. You guys are definitely recruiting more women. Um, I, I don't think in 2019 there's a reason that you should only have six officers of color in your whole department. That's great. pretty outrageous. But I also know that with the climate and all that you need to change in your department, like if I were a person of color and I read about Brian Tate, I'd say, oh, I'm not going to work in There's no way I would work in a department that has got, that, that there's one in him, there's a lot, whole lot more, right? I mean, that's, that's what people of color are going to think, right? That's what women are going to think. That's what people who have disability are going to think. Or anyone who's among those uh, minority groups that he, you know, prattled off on. So, I mean, so that part's important that in the department that there is a very robust conversation about we're going to hire people that are not white. We're going to hire women, obviously. Um, we're going to hire people that are gay. We're going to hire different kinds of people, and we're not going to talk shit about them or anybody else in the community who's not male and white. So I don't know how you do that, but I, I think that that's not the conversation that a lot of our institutions have, and when they do have it, it's very um, superficial. I'm, I'm just saying the truth, because there's all kinds of data that there's not that that's the case. So that hasn't been a priority in our, in our, in our city beyond the superficial trappings of it. We have some questions from the audience at home. Okay, I'll get <laughs> That's right so uh, hokey, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting on right now to see it. Okay, well... Uh, got it. Huh? Okay. She's got it. Okay, got it. I've got it. Um, <clears throat> well, I can't get that to show. Well, did you have something yeah. um, related to... <laughs> I can't get the um, rest of data and policy. So we know oh, that in 2017 when okay. CPD policy require written, that drivers have written, give written consent for searches that, that actually is the only data point I know of where racial disparities went down. And I think I read recently that that policy has been changed. It's no longer being required. And I'm very disappointed since that's the only one that seems to have decreased racial disparities. Is that true? And what, what, how did that happen? It is. And I changed it. And here's why. So what we had, we had two things occurring. We can, we can track when we ask for consent without writing it down. Um, all of our stuff is videotaped. And I can train people and tell them how to ask for consent, when to ask for consent, uh, when it's appropriate and when it's not. But what I can't do is track things that people don't document. So when you have a data point that is inaccurate because people don't document it, and I can't track it, then it doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it gives people a false impression that something has gotten better when it has not. Do you understand what I'm saying? No, I don't. How did it look? How did it, it look like it got better, but it didn't? So we have two things that happen. One, officers aren't asking for consent when they should. Mm -hmm. And I can't verify every time they asked for consent, they filled out a card. How did you find that out? How did, I mean, what, how did... I lived it. I mean, I go out on these traffic stops and the officer's sitting there and someone says, well, you can search my car. The officer may not have even asked them. A lot of people will just say, you can search my car. And then the officer doesn't ask them to sign the consent form. Why would they? They didn't ask them. 
Well, because in their mind, <laughs> it has been demonstrated to increase the disparity, like in North Carolina, where they've analyzed 20 million traffic stops. That was but I can track the information without putting it on a card. So what I can do is say, okay, instead of taking this card that is going to get lost, and what happened with them is they were getting lost. So we have this paper copy, and we tell them, fill it out that you asked for consent and have them sign it. When we're videotaping those consents already, so that card really doesn't do anything other than it has a signature on it. Well, but the action of the driver writing consent does have an impact. I mean, I, I've read some there's literature that says it's, having it on a body cam is not the same, and it doesn't result in the same. It's very data, but so hold on. Yeah, I, so so I, don't, I don't want to discourage officers for asking for consent when they should, mm -hmm. and I don't want to have data that I think is inaccurate and not being tracked properly mm -hmm. because they are being forced to fill out a card when nobody's presented any data to me that it has made any changes. So if you had it, I would look at it. Um, but I think there are so many other variables that surround that issue particularly that saying that a card does something for that or doesn't is the action of writing it down. I, I, I understand that. I don't know that I am fully invested in that like you are. Uh -huh. I'm just being honest. So um, I think this is a data collection issue, right? For I mean, me. How, how you collect data and how the data can be tracked. I, I don't hear you saying I'm against having consent searches, but but the data is not being collect, collected in such a way right. that it can be outputted in a way that can be tracked and analyzed. Right, so one of the things that I haven't talked about is I've tried to take the way that we process or collect data and shorten that into a way that is usable, that people will actually report things. What does that look like? So in our CAD system currently, there are some things that we used to track through our blue team system. Are you guys familiar with that? It, it's a program that takes 20 minutes, you think, for some things to be entered into blue team. One of those is handcuffing without an arrest. So I'm going to talk about consent searches and handcuffing without an arrest and shooting deer. Those are the three things that we're going to track in a way that we didn't before. So consent searches required a card. If I shot a deer that was injured on the side of the road and beyond repair, um, just to put it out of its misery, I had to put it in blue team. It's a 20 minute data entry to tell you that I shot a deer on the side of the road in a ditch, which we already reported to our supervisor and joint communications over the radio, so that when they heard a gunshot and someone reported it, that they didn't send 12 cops. Um, handcuffing without an arrest. We were tracking that. In the time that I've been there, I think there has been one incident out of thousands where the officer was told, hey, you probably shouldn't have handcuffed that person. But what was happening was officers were not self-reporting when they were handcuffing someone without an arrest because it's on video and they're thinking, I'm going to have to go in there and do 20 minutes of data entry. It was a legitimate stop for a legitimate reason. And that's what the officer's thinking. But there's no way to go back and review that. So I need them to self-report that so I can track it, right? Because the, the data that went into that is junk, as far as I'm concerned. So what I've done with those things, shooting a deer, handcuffing without arrest, and consent searches, is said, hey, if you do those things, put in CAD, our, our notes in our system, a key word, consent, handcuffing, and I can't remember what the word is that they're using for deer. It happens pretty infrequently. But when we put those into CAD under the new policy, and it's not in effect yet, but when we do, it will be tracked. But I know that an officer is much more likely to take the three seconds to write the word handcuffing in CAD than it is to drive back to the station, do 20 minutes of data entry for something as simple as shooting a deer in a ditch or asking for consent. But it's, I don't know, I'd have to look at the signature thing and see I'm not convinced, but I'm not saying so I wouldn't have the conversation. This, so are you saying that when um, the consent search was signed, it involved a 20-minute procedure? No, but it did take them 
one, having those book of cards and it not getting lost in a patrol car that's jostled around, driven in emergency situations. If you can imagine driving a car like that, crap goes everywhere. It's under the seats, it's in the back seat. It, it's hard to find some of that stuff sometimes. Mm -hmm. Or just a cop having a tow sheet, they don't always have them with them because someone took it out and didn't replace it. So a lot of times, they wouldn't even have the card with them. They'd have to call for another officer to show up with the card. <laughs> So then they wait for 20 minutes while someone roadside waiting for the consent. I know that they're not self-reporting. Well, I don't know it. I suspect it, but I, I feel pretty confident in that. So if, so then they get the card and they sign it. Then it goes in the car and hopefully it didn't fall between the seats, go under the seat, get thrown away with whatever fast food that they had for dinner that night, because that happens too. And then make sure that it goes to the right mailbox and that person who took it to their desk didn't shuffle it in with a stack of papers. And all of this sounds like the things that happen every day at the Columbia Police Department. Couldn't they take a picture of that and just email it? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Or do you it want to do What are they going to take a picture with? But, 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 Camera. but it's a matter of a data collection. So you've yeah. got to have some kind of system where <clears throat> the data is going in and not on a car. It's kind of like so it goes into CAD and it goes says... into the system so it can be retrieved. And yeah. when it's in that system, the video is attached. Yeah, right. So we have some record of it. So are there other things that you're adding that you're keeping track of in terms of data? So, I mean, you said consent. So I'm assuming that you're looking at these practices that you have out in the field and you want to get more information about your practice. So what other queries are you setting up in your system to do a better job of, of managing, uh, managing and overseeing what compliance, I guess, if you will, or the discretion that your officers are um, applying, if does that make sense? It does, but we're not to that point okay. because for the same reason we're doing that VSR committee, I think there's a lot of stuff out there that we could very easily track that caused gaps in that data, or that we haven't tracked accurately, like consent searches, that would give that group a more accurate picture of what is going on. Mm -hmm. So the goal is to have accurate information and to look at those variables. So, and be consistent in the collection. Right, so and let's in, say... In terms of the mechanism for collecting information. Right, so let's say that they go and they say there's this huge disparity in searches. We know that there already is. But is it this disparity, this disparity or is it this disparity? Mm -hmm. And I suspect that we're showing this disparity when it's this. And that committee really needs to have accurate information if they're going to look at any variables writing on a card, using a card at all, why is the officer asking for consent, in what circumstances do they ask for consent, uh, what's their thought process. We have officers who have come from other agencies who have been trained to ask for consent on every single stop that they do. Why? I mean, can we do it legally? Yeah. Is it really necessary? Absolutely not. But we need to be looking at those things and saying what is best practice. That committee cannot get there with inaccurate information. So do you believe the stop information that you have that the department's been reporting? So you've already reported your stop information mm -hmm. for this year to the Attorney General's office. Mm -hmm. So is there anything different in how the data was reported this year versus last year? No. Because that's that data that the department's giving is the department's data. Right. I think so, that that is as accurate as information can get. Right. So we're interested in the disparity in, in stops and of course the consent thing and all that's really important too. But what's consistent is this pattern of stops not just here but, but, but everywhere. So we're still, still interested in how you're going to frame understanding why we consistently, and it's increased from 2000 to 2018 every year, 
So what, what that is about. And, and I think that's why we need to have accurate data collection. We need to have people from all these different disciplines, backgrounds, and experiences looking at the information and saying, what are we missing? Because like I've said over and over again, the information that we have, even if it's correct, is inadequate. That goes to the Attorney General's office. So, do you, think, you think it's inadequate because of the way it's collected? I think it's because of what is being collected and how it's being collected. I'll give you an example. So I come up to you and I stop your car. I walk up and I think, I've seen her at a house that I know <coughs> someone uses drugs because I've dealt with them on some other call I know that they use. And I've seen you at that house. I'm going to go ahead and ask for consent, but I don't really know anything about you. But I know that you've been over there. So with that little piece of information, fully justified in asking, I ask you for consent. You deny me consent. We don't fill out a card because you didn't consent, but we're not collecting whether or not I asked you and you denied it. <coughs> That's an important piece of information, mm -hmm. right? We're not collecting that. And I would suspect that the committee is going to find other pieces of information like that that are relevant to this conversation. The other side to this is I'm not trying to reduce disparity so that I'm helping one group not get stopped by the police. I'm trying to reduce disparity in how we apply our stops so that we're fairly and impartially enforcing the law. That's I the still that's the, that's the point, right? I, I still need to make sure that we are stopping people who are violating the law that we are searching people who are most likely to have contraband based on intelligence. I've talked about intelligence-led operations a lot. But this isn't just about reducing the disparity index for me. This is about fairly applying our police services to our community in a way that we all understand, that is fair to everyone, that is responsible, that effectively addresses crime issues. Um, but I don't know what all those variables are. I think the committee will have a better idea. But they, there's so many data gaps in that that I suspect that they're gonna find and hopefully be able to come up with a way to collect it. Dorian yes. doesn't totally bog us down and shut us down. Yeah, we have a couple of questions from the uh, bail fund. And then somebody has sent uh, them come in, and then we have a, a, a great question that would be a good closing question from somebody. Um, the two questions from the bail fund is that we notice that people's bail amounts are much higher when they have a nonviolent offense, maybe even a misdemeanor, but added on to that is resisting arrest. And Carol Brown and I had talked with you about that uh, quite a while back. We want to know what what is resisting arrest, and I know that's a, that's a big question, but uh, we would open like to open up a longer conversation about what that entails, because some people thought, uh, even on our group, thought it meant if somebody had attacked an officer or shoved an officer or done something physical or even something very aggressive verbally but it doesn't have to be but even it, uh, there there doesn't seem to be any um there are the facts of the case that help people set the amount of bail but insisting arrest in it in and of itself is just you know, a singular category. It doesn't take all those nuances into effect. So I'd like to open that up some other time. We're, we're almost out of time. Another one we had is about towing of vehicles. Uh, we have had people who have been arrested and jailed, and their vehicle was towed to a tow lot, and when we bail them out, they are unable to get their property out of their vehicles because the tow lot says no. 
They might have everything they own in life is in that car because they were living in the car, they were homeless, <coughs> or they had a child who had a car seat in the car and they can't get the car seat, uh, which they don't have enough money to buy another one. Um, who knows what else? Medicine, uh, records like Social Security, that kind of thing. It, do, is there a way for us to find out if these tow lots are operating within the law when they deny the police person the right to get their property out of that car that's been towed? And it's usually been towed because the officer has called a, I know, I know it's sort of a revolving list of tow well, companies. The record of the week, yeah. And I don't know if they all have the same policies, but we're running into this. And it's a sad situation because people can't get jobs, they can't get stuff for their lives, they can't get their clothes if they were living in the car. So uh, that might be another longer conversation that we can have. It's a longer conversation. But um, we want to put that in your thinking cap. Uh, <laughs> Do people still use that term? Sure. <laughs> oh, oh, uh, <laughs> oh, God. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm sure you have a thinking cap back at the, the, the office. <laughs> so, but um, there's a great question that came in also it, because somebody said they were very impressed by the, your thoughtful responses, the changes you're making, but they want to know. Um, what message from the public would show support for the changes? Uh, and what do you think would resonate most with the officers? And what ways can we show support and help booster the idea of community-oriented policing? So in other words, they are pleased with what you have been saying, but want to know what is our role out here as people not on the force to um, either advocate or to nudge you further. So I think it's like with any other type of management um, of people is that you reward things publicly. And I think if members of the public see police officers doing things that they appreciate and they highlight those things, whether that's you know publicly in a a meeting or on social media or through the media itself I think when you point out that those things that you're pleased with that most people try to please others and if you're wanting that to continue then you should praise those things that you want to continue um, and like anything else when it's something that you think needs improvement you have to have that conversation it doesn't mean going out publicly and you know, like with employees, when Mike messes up constantly, I'm kidding. But I don't, I don't go to Mike and say, what were you thinking in front of everybody in our shift meeting? But I, if Mike did something good, I'm going to talk about what great things he did in front of everybody in shift meeting. Now I'm going to pull him into my office and say, what were you thinking? Right? So I think it's good to have these smaller conversations and say, what were you thinking? Um, but I think it's very important that you proactively support the, the, those things that you see. Um, one thing that you'll find out about me and the people who work for me is I don't just say things. Um, I don't really have any desire or any energy to do that. If I say it, it's because it's something I either want to do and I'm trying to get there or we've done it. Um, but when you support those things very proactively, intentionally support those things. I think that that is the simplest and most effective way that you can support the police. And that, that may be telling a police officer, my gosh, you did a great job. Sending them an email, calling them, telling their boss, you know, he stopped at my house and told me my garage door was up. I really appreciated that. Do what? Or she. Or she. I just like to mess with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, what if, what if it's you? I like it though. I mean, tell your boss. Here's what I will tell you. I, I really appreciate that. That the people who work for me 
really need your support and I don't want the focus to be on me. The media focuses on me plenty. Um, this is really about them. So um, I think it's really important that we focus on the good work that they do every day because they really do go out and try to do their best and they fall short sometimes. We all do. Uh, but we you pick each other up and you dust them off and try to correct whatever the issue is and you move forward. And uh, if we do that all together as a community, as hokey as that sounds, I think that's a word you might have used earlier. Yeah, hokey and thinking capitalism are my two things. But it really is important that we recognize that our cops and their families are part of this community. So when someone says something negative or we very publicly mess something up, it affects their whole family, and we need to recognize that. It's not just a public official doing a very public job. It's their whole support system is affected by them making a mistake, and we need to recognize that and support them even when they make a mistake if it's something that we can fix. So, I don't know, my soapbox. Yeah, and I think this questioner was more out talking about how do we support the policy changes that you're making um, as well. Uh, she wasn't thinking about giving kudos to individual officers as much oh, as... Oh, I see. The policy we, itself? Yeah, what can we do to support the change process? Well, all of the policies that I change, like our use of force policy, our pursuit policy, you came to one of those meetings, didn't you? The policy review meetings? Yeah. No? I, I see you more. I just haunt you, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> it just thinks you're there you. by me. <laughs> yeah, she was at every one of those meetings. <laughs> I do see you a lot. <laughs> uh, I do see you. And not just in meetings. I see you out, too. We frequent a lot of the same places, I think. Um, we do a policy review meeting. So when I change a policy, we have a meeting and we go through what the changes are, the decision making behind those changes, people make recommendations. We've changed the policy in those meetings based on public comment. Do you have minutes for those? And how do you keep track of the changes? Well, it's all redlined. So you can see what the draft was and then what it became. When do you, when do you, do you announce the meetings? How do you, how do you do that? I know that there's been one policy meeting. Mm, there's been three policy That's, meetings. So do you, does somebody take minutes for those meetings? No, because it's not. It's not a public uh, meeting, it's an in-house. It's an interested parties. People come in and they give input, but it's, it's, it's me just trying to be transparent. But the other side of that is, you're cringing, but the other side of that is the CPRB also wants to somehow they have a function that deals with policy and making recommendations. Okay, well, that was my next. That was my next thing. Is so, how do you marry that to the CPRB so that they are in alignment with the changes that you're making and they understand? Because um, it's not clear to me that that's that's happening. I mean, Nina goes to those meetings. Linda does go to the CPRB meetings, so she can actually speak to that uh, a lot more in terms of. Dysfunction. Well, and I'm, I'm not going to talk about the board itself. They, they will take whatever responsibility and act however they need to act and do whatever their functions are. I understand what those are and I respect that. What I refuse to do is allow someone else to take responsibility that I, for something that I think is important for us to do. So me making policy changes and putting that information out there, it's kind of like um, sending your kid off to school. It's not the teacher's responsibility to teach my kid. It's my responsibility to teach my kids, but the teachers are a tool in that. And I look at the CPRB the same way. It's my responsibility to make sure you know what my policies are, at least have the opportunity to review them, and know why I made the decisions that I did. It's not the CPRB's responsibility. To do that. So we should expect for them to have those conversations at their meetings, um, you know, giving feedback to those, those changes. And so, Lynn, Lynn goes to those meetings and watches more closely in chat. So and I, I think they're interested in that, and we've had some brief conversations about it, but it needs work. Okay. Um, we are at the beginning hour because Lynn, Lynn is, you know, 
When is my barometer of when it's <laughs> 8 o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so we, we have to stop at 8 o'clock. Okay. But I would like to um, put two things in the, um, in the, in the parking, uh, Peggy, is that um, we would like to meet with you at another time, our board, to talk about um, some of the issues that are coming up um, in, the, in the bail conversation. And also to revisit um, the issue of uh, policies, if we can. And then um, I'd like uh, maybe in a few months to revisit, if we could, um, big ideas, like how do we, how do, we do the collaboration thing mm -hmm. in a, a bigger way? It'll be further down the pipe. Absolutely. But, yeah. I knew mean, I mean, you'd say yes. So well, I, I, when you, in your policy review meetings, you mentioned interested parties are invited. Is that? Public or yeah, anybody can come. Um, so when would be the next one? It's based on when he gets them done. He sends out an email blast. If you on that, Bob Dockler is the guy to contact. So, was it? How do you? How do you uh, I'm on that mail list. I can forward. Oh, okay, okay. okay. So that's cool. Bob Dockler. Yeah. Thank you. And somebody out there is. Um, and I know you mentioned this early on, but maybe they tune in later. Still curious about the the outcome of the Brian. Is it Brian Tate? Yeah. Officer Tate's uh, when that decision will be made. Oh yeah. Can I ask that? But I don't when? know if you can say. You, about you can it. ask whatever you want about it. I'm not going to comment on it. I knew it. <laughs> <But yes. laughs> I gave you the investigation. No. Me over here biting my tongue. <laughs> I saw you biting your tongue. You I saw him smiling like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. Yeah, thank you guys very much for coming. And we got a lot of watchers.